Um, do you sense, I mean, I, I get this feeling like we're not, we're, we are in an uprising, there are revolts, but I don't have this feeling that it's um, an actual revolutionary moment, as in there's a real, you know, you talked about the things that led up to this, of course, with the pandemic, the economic crisis that we're in the midst of. Um, and uh, I think you mentioned Bernie Sanders and the failure of that campaign um, and all of that. And then, 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 of course, the killing of George Floyd, setting this all off. Uh, do you feel, do you sense that Americans are going to have uh, developed a sense of class consciousness that could eventually evolve into becoming some kind of multi layered, intersectional, revolutionary movement? Or do you think America is not going to do that at all? We don't know. No one knows. I mean, I just read Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution. Mm -hmm. And when everything broke out, uh, you know, all the Bolshevik leaders were caught by surprise. Everyone was caught by surprise. So that's usually how revolutions work. That was true in Eastern Europe. You start with small demands. uh, And and the very act of resistance uh, gives people a sense of empowerment. Uh, and uh, often um, uh, explodes into a movement that uh, goes far beyond uh, the initial demands and and calls for a restructuring of power. So it's possible, it's not inevitable, but it is possible. And I think class consciousness is in fact uh, pretty widespread across the political spectrum. You see that in polls, uh, people's attitude towards the big banks, towards the rich who don't pay taxes. Uh, that that uh, kind of crosses political lines. Um, I mean, I'm a fierce critic of corporate capitalism, uh, but no friend of the right wing or Trump. But I was, uh, before the pandemic, I was coming back from Washington. I was standing in line to get the train, and the woman in back of me tapped on my shoulder, and she said, I... I know who you are, and I admire everything you write. And by the way, I voted for Trump. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the appeal of uh, both Trump and Sanders was very similar in that they named the fleecing of the working class and the working poor by corporate power. Trump, of course, is a con artist and a demagogue, but they both spoke to a reality that cuts across political lines. So I would say at this point, the class consciousness is there. Whether they will form, that will be formulated into a coherent uh, vision that can take the place of what we have. I mean, all of that's an unknown. No one knows. No one can tell you. In that sense, having covered revolutions and uprisings, they're mysterious entities that have a kind of life of their own. Um, which no one can predict, even the purported leaders of those movements. Mm. Yeah, that's that's sort of the mysterious thing about it. Is uh, and I think when this pandemic started, I think I, I I talked about this with people I knew. Was this sort of it was a, it was more of a feeling than anything. It was like things are changing in a way, and and in a in a way that's very <laughs> rapid. That I don't think that we even could get a handle on it at the time several months passed and that feeling hasn't dissipated. It seems to have only um, been amplified. And well, that's what revolutions are. They're primarily driven by emotions, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. correlates with my own experience. And also Trotsky writes the same thing. They're emotional events. Mm -hmm. And, you know, often there's a kind of incohate quality to it and that people feel something, but quite, can't quite articulate it, but then as things evolve, they are able to articulate it. So I think it's all there. Where it goes, really, we don't know. I mean, you know, there was a revolution in Russia in 1905 uh, that didn't work. Uh, And so we don't know. I, I hope, I hope that, because it's the only hope we have. I hope people stay in the streets. I hope they call power to account. I hope they refuse to be gaslighted as the Democratic Party establishment is attempting to do. Um, And my sense is that they get it. Um, You know, I'm not out there in the streets. I'm actually spending every day writing a book about mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. 
I've taught in the prisons for the last decade. So, but uh, that's my sense from a distance. Okay. Uh, the last paragraph of your, your article, um, you say this, the longer the ruling elite refuse to address the root causes behind these protests, the more they loot the treasury to enrich themselves and their fellow oligarchs, the more they engage in futile and absurd efforts to, to deflect blame, the more unrest will spread. The last desperate resort by the oligarchs to save themselves will be to stoke the fires of racialized violence between disenfranchised whites and disenfranchised people of color. This, I fear, is the next chapter in the saga. I saw this tactic used to, to deadly effect in the former Yugoslavia. These are dark times. They are about to get darker. Do you speak to that? The idea that, as you talked about with Yugoslavia, I'm sure there's other parallels that we could that you could point to, but uh, the stoking of racial divisions. What exactly do you uh, mean by that? Well, we're already seeing it. I mean, you know, the, this 75 year old man in Buffalo who's knocked down by the police and sent to the hospital suddenly becomes an Antifa supporter. I mean. <laughs> yeah. uh, you are seeing it in terms of the efforts to uh, discredit and uh, carry out character assassination against people who have been victims of police violence. That is as old as police violence, completely predictable. Uh, you know, that George Floyd was a violent criminal. He did the same thing to Eric Garner. It's quite and a lab and, they, and the media provides an echo chamber for it. So as the elites become more cornered, <clears throat> they will use that uh, traditional tool, which has always been at play within American society, uh, to turn this into a kind of animus between disenfranchised whites and disenfranchised people of color. I think the difference perhaps is that um, there are a lot of people, a lot of white people, fortunately, who are part of this movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it interesting that the demands in terms of either disbanding or defunding the police really come out of the Black Lives Matter movement. These, you know, there's a kind of uh, genuine quality to these demands out of oppressed communities. And I think it's, significant that you know the, the the white people who are involved in these protests have essentially accepted uh the black leadership i think all of that is really significant and gives to these protests a kind of um authenticity and organic quality that perhaps past protests have not had but that they'll play the racial card that is certain, mm -hmm. uh, especially as Trump becomes more and more marginalized. Um, yeah, and I think we're already seeing signs of it. 